So hello, this is um, a talk by me and my friend Morris. Morris can't be here, but um, that's okay. I'm speaking on his behalf. And um, about myself, I'm an OBC developer, a free software developer on, uh, for work. I do <coughs> contracts, sort of freelance stuff in, in open source. A lot of it is involves OpenBSD. Um, it also involves Subversion and also OsmoCon recently. And um, Morris is an actor. And um, he wants to use, well, he uses a Windows PC right now, which is installed in his, in his flat. And I, I watched him use it, and it felt kind of sad because it really confused him a lot. And he told me he wanted a Macintosh laptop one day. And um, he's not really able to buy one, so he can't afford it. And I didn't really want to invest my time into maintaining a Windows or Mac machine for him, but I wanted to help him. And I wanted something to talk about at BSC CAC. <laughs> and so I proposed this win-win deal to him where I said, well, what about I try to get you a laptop that you can use and that is geared towards your needs, ideally. Um, and I can use this as a research project and use case study to figure out whether it's possible to do this and whether um, you know, what we can learn from, from doing this. If there's anything we can learn about OpenBSD. And, um, and he said, sure. So this, this shows Mars uh, with a band and some play. I think that should be updated around the, the 90s, perhaps, this picture. Um, Morris started out in, his voice is weird, wait, oh yeah, I have to get used to the way this is presented. So Morris is also painting pictures, and this is one of the, this is a picture he painted for me uh, for my birthday this year. He started out in, in Brighton, um, studying there, doing European studies, economics, and German. And he spent a year abroad in Berlin uh, while he was studying. And um, this happened to be the same university that I would study in later. In 1982, after graduating in Brighton, he went back to Berlin and stayed there permanently. And what's interesting is that he moved to a flat which is around the corner from where I live today. And um, he's still in the area, but it's not exactly this house anymore, but I could just walk up there and take a picture of it. This is the reason why it's interesting to make a laptop for Morris. Um, Morris survived a brain hemorrhage in 1996. He was at the gym where I am training today and basically collapsed. And um, there were medical students around who recognized what was happening to him and called an ambulance. And apparently there was also a brain surgeon conference happening in the city at, at the same time. <laughs> and they got an expert to, to surgery on him for two days. And he was then in coma for a week and then in intensive care at the hospital for a year, during which time he also caught a hospital bug, um, which gave him diarrhea for a month. And it was a pretty unpleasant year for him. And it had a lot of consequences for his life because uh, he lost a lot of things that he could do. And um, so basically half, uh, one half of the brain is sort of damaged and the other half tried to compensate. And so he had to essentially relearn how to walk, speak, and read and write. He has a stiff left leg, which um, makes him go really slow. He is unable to control, uh, control his left arm. And he has a has a head land that's permanently cramped, so you can't really open it. So it's, for using a computer, for example, this hand is not really very useful. Um, he also has bad short-term memory and a very limited attention span. So he is easily distracted by things happening around him, and he can't really focus for long, very long conversations. And also having conversations with him takes a long time, and you have to be very patient because his speech is very slow. Like he, even formulating like sentences takes, takes a while. 
What's interesting though is that when you observe him in a group, you see him laughing at jokes almost instantly. So he gets what's happening around him, right? It's like he, it's like this part is okay, but the the output part is kind of kind of uh, has a problem. And so I wondered, okay, so what do you actually use a computer for? You know, we talked about this and. And he said, you know, what, what everybody says who's not at BSD CAN. He says, well, I'm using Gmail, I'm using Facebook to contact friends, I'm doing calls over Skype, I listen to the radio, the BBC, and he reads news sites and he says he wants to write a book. I'm not sure if that's very realistic, but it's an aspiration. And, and yeah, so basically, from this point of view, his needs are very normal. It's just like he wants a computer that, that anyone can use, right? And having a computer that anyone can use implies that OpenBSD is up against some pretty hard requirements because um, when I give him a laptop, then I have to explain like, oh, by the way, the Wi-Fi won't work, the camera won't work, the sound won't work because we don't have drivers for it. He's going to say, why are we doing this? And so I needed to find hardware that essentially has perfect support. It has to start up and shut down and suspend resume. It has to have working IO devices like keyboard <coughs> mice and, and a working display. Speakers have to work, the microphone has to work, the camera has to work for video calls and stuff like that. The network connection has to be okay, reliable, and it has to have the battery life. I mean, it sounds like a normal laptop that I'm describing, but as many of you know, having all these expectations at once can be pretty daunting when you're running an open source system, which is um, funded by corporations. And on the software side, he needs basically a desktop environment. Uh, he needs a web browser for Gmail, Facebook, and something that can play BBC streams, and read new sites, and we need some solution for video calls because Skype won't run because it's proprietary software, so we can't run it on BSD. And what's also important to keep in mind is that essentially the, the ideal computer is an appliance. He doesn't have to think about how it works, he just has to turn it on and turn it off, and it's always behaving as he expects at a given moment, and it should be very simple to use. And this is actually quite a challenge. To find a machine like this, especially when we started out, it was on OpenBSD 6.4, so this was January this year, so OpenBSD 6.4 was the current release. And one of the machines that looked good for this purpose was the MacBook X that Joshua Stein had written about on his blog. And one of the things that I, the first thing I tested with this was that, because I'm a friend of mine, Gonzalo, the, also an OPC developer, he had this machine. And so we took it to Morris and we tried how, just how the handling works. So can you handle this machine? And one of the important things was that he could actually lift the lid of the laptop with just one hand. So you didn't have to like have another arm to hold against the base of the laptop while opening it. And this was one of the first things we tested. And we also liked what it looked like, you know, because it looks a bit like a Mac. So he was kind of like, oh, this is my dream come true. Also, it has standard PC components, um, which means that a lot of the hardware is already supported. The Wi-Fi works, for example. So in OpenBSD 6.4, we already had relatively good hardware support. And so I installed OpenBSD 6.4 for him on this uh, laptop. And um, yeah, there were some problems. So, so the, the, on the driver level, um, we didn't have full complete support for this machine. So the webcam wasn't working because the USB stack lagged isochronous transfers in the, on USB 3. Um, only one speaker on the laptop was working. The other one was, was mute. Um, the microphone didn't work out of the box, and there's no support for Bluetooth, and Morris pointed at the, out uh, his uh, Bluetooth speakers that he's using with his other laptop, which was Windows, and I said, well, that's probably never going to work. Um, but we stuck, we tried anyway, and this is was the result. We booted up, installed TDM, <laughs> started GNOME, and I showed Morris the laptop with a black screen and a mouse cursor, and I said, this is kind of embarrassing, but well, you know, it's a start. And yeah, so this is basically what happens if you install OpenBSD 6.4, install GNOME, and a user after installation and try to start GNOME. Right? It comes up like this. 
And yeah, that's kind of that's kind of stupid. Um, it's defensive. The problem is Chrome that is telling you to run away. Yeah, Chrome is telling me to run away. Exactly. Chrome is telling me I need more memory. Well, it's not telling me that. It's I had to actually dig in and find out. But the problem was that the, the JavaScript engine just allocates a gigabyte of memory at startup, and if it can't get it, it just fails. And then there's no feedback from the user as to what happened. And and this was actually reported on the list as well several times. And somebody eventually pinned it down to this thing that's only happening for new user accounts. Because if you add a user during install with the installer, it gets added to the staff group and therefore has enough memory limit. But if you do the default user add, then you just get half a, half a gig, and that's not enough. And so yeah, this is how you, how you make Chrome actually run. So then it started. And uh, we tried BBC. And this is what we got. So I had done package at GNOME, package at Firefox, start up the BBC. I look at that, and well, the first thing was that the stream just didn't start and told me I need, I need Flash. So I went to the HTML5 page of the BBC, and it still told me, um, we think this page has the embedded HTML5 player enabled. It looks, it is below, and the HTML5 player tells me, sorry, you need Flash to play this. And this was very confusing, and I didn't really know what to do. And um, what I ended up doing was at first I, I found MP3 streams on the internet that people were running, to, to copied the BBC news streams that Morris wanted to listen to, and then I just gave him links to that, and Firefox could play those MP3s. And he would only see like a blue progress bar, and he, he looked at me and said, like, where, where are the pictures? And so I couldn't, I couldn't give him the, the pictures at first. And, uh, a few weeks later, uh, Stuart Henderson pointed out that you need to install the FFmpeg package in addition to Firefox to get HTML5 working. And I was like, oh, okay. So I tried that, and suddenly the BBC started working. So this was just an out-of-the-box problem, right? It's not like we don't support it. It's just that if you don't actually read the Firefox readme like, like we do, you, you end up like this. And. Um, yeah, there were some odd hardware quirks in the machine. So one morning he calls me and says, like, oh, every website is telling me it's insecure, and I have all these problems with, with Facebook. I can't go to Facebook. I can't go to Gmail. I can't do anything. And his, uh, another friend uh, of his was there, and he also he was, he was sort of technical, but he couldn't figure out what was going on, why he was getting these warnings. And so I went over, and I looked at the machine. And it turns out the clock was in January 2016. And this had happened because he had left the laptop discharge overnight. And if you do this with this machine, then the, the clock resets to that date. And so all the SSL certificates appear to be invalid. So mm -hmm. I had to disable NTP constraints and disable NTPD-S to, to permanently fix this for him. So be, because he will leave the laptop to discharge, because you know, we can't assume that he always remembers to, to plug it. So well, that, was, that fixed that. It's a bit less secure now, but at least it will do the SSL security stuff correctly. And another thing, we, we had a hardware failure, which actually happened like a week before I flew out. Uh, the screen started flickering. And I thought, OK, we have to do something about this. And, and I, I was really hoping to find a solution before we, um, we uh, before I was in Canada. But it, it happened it were to work out. Gonzalo told me where to go in Berlin to get a brand new laptop for the broken one. And they just gave it to me under warranty. It was great. So that was good. Um, touchpad has some, it's a bit problematic on this machine, so it doesn't have the buttons marked. And it's, it's uh, sort of emulating a mouse, so you get a WS mouse device. And uh, when Morris was clicking things, sometimes he would be ending up pasting words or something that, that um, ended up in the clipboard. And you'll see later why this is problematic, because a lot of the words he's typing end up in the clipboard. And so, um, so yeah, I just asked our touchpad developer and Wolf, and he recommended this line below, that just this input magic command. And if you look at it, you'll realize that it just maps button two to, map to button one. So it essentially just disables the middle button of the mouse. And this way, there are only two buttons on the touchpad, and it's easier for most to deal with that. So you can still use like the right click context menus, um, but without all the, all the pasting, which he never uses. It doesn't use it only happens accidentally. And there's another weird hardware twist with this, which um, Joshua Stein again pointed out to me. So the touchpad is a little bit flappy. 
And if you put sticky tape below it, um, it's more firm. It feels nicer. It feels more like a Mac Touch pad. I haven't tried that yet, but I'm gonna, going to. OK, so what did Boris do in the 1980s? While he was in Berlin, you can pretty much see um, where this is going. He, he had a good time there. I mean, there were, he, there were reasons he came back to Berlin, right? I mean, where in the world can you chat up a girl between Pixar Bargo and Nick Cave at 3 a.m. In, in a bar? That's not the story he likes to tell. And yeah, he did lots of farting and clubbing and stuff. And he joined a theater group called the Berlin Play Actors. It's really weird creative stuff, and it was really cool. And he actually acted, directed, and produced plays at the time. So he, so he did a lot of work and lots of organizations. He, he says, um, and my friend did the production. The numbers were always in the red at the end, but when I did the production, we always came out, came out positive, and he was always happy to, you know, to, to manage all this stuff. So he was actually very good at the time and um, starting a career. Uh, they were touring in the U.S. even, so they did like stuff in New York and San Francisco and in Italy. You see the newspaper reports there of their place in the 80s, and of course they did parties, parties, parties uh, with no end. And uh, coming back to the technical stuff, um, one of the things we wanted to do was the video calls. And so we had to get the webcam to work. And the problem wasn't that the webcam driver was missing, but the, the, the piece that connects the webcam driver to the USB stack was missing. And so, um, so basically, streaming devices like audio and video, this is an audio device I used for, for hacking on this. Um, they require streaming transmissions with, where you don't care that you've lost some data. As soon as you have like some bit of decision gets damaged or lost, you just want to get the next the next byte. You don't care about reliable transmission like you do for disks, and and it's also a different mode than when you use a keyboard and mice on USB, which are interrupt driven. And so our our basically our host controller driver XSCI for USB three. Host controller simply lacked this transmission mode or support for it, so it couldn't use, it didn't have the right error handling for it, it didn't have the right way to, to, to push the buffers in and out of the hardware, and so this was simply not done. It was not implemented. And I had um, started working on that in 2017 because I realized that uh, MPI, was, who had written the driver originally, had no interest in getting this to work because his use cases were already covered. And he said, well, someone else can do that. And so I looked at it. And I could, I, back then, I got it to the point where I could play audio. But the audio had, had skips in it, like little crackling noises. And when I left the laptop sitting around long enough playing a file, it would eventually just emit really loud static noise. And so I thought, well, this patch isn't quite ready yet. Something is still wrong, but I couldn't figure out what was wrong. So I committed my code, but it was disabled. And so this year, I thought, well, I'll go back to this. And I, I started asking um, questions about it. And it turns out that there were other people who were interested in fixing this. So Marcus Glocker actually bailed me in January and asked me, what's the state of this? Why isn't it working yet? And we said, well, there is some bug that we can't figure out. And Patrick came and said, oh, I have this weird problem on an ARM board with some USB controller. And I have a bus analyzer at work. So I, I'm looking at that, and this is this is happening, and so he had a fix for this, and he found a fix for his problem, and I thought, well, that's interesting. Perhaps that is why my code didn't work. And so I, I sent this question to Patrick, and Patrick responded, no, that's not your problem, but I think this is your problem here in the diff. And so then um, I forwarded the diff to Marcus, who was interested in getting working on this. And then the two of them started collaborating. I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> and then uh, uh, MPI joined the conversation and gave them some hints. And uh, in the end, Alexander Rajov fixed a lot of bugs in it. And yeah, so this was really nice because they did it in parallel to me doing all the other stuff. And um, it happened just it just happened to be that the, the right time, the right people showed up and made it work. And and I could uh, start testing video calls. This was great. And the uh, other thing uh, with the speaker. Uh, was quite interesting, and that's also not work done by me. That is work done by Joshua Stein, which is really crazy. He like reverse engineered the the Realtek Windows driver for this particular audio device in his laptop, um, found the magic sequence of commands which end up enabling the right speaker, 
and had a long list of, of hex values that you sort of feed into the hardware. And you first put that on a, there was a Linux bug for it too, because it didn't work in Linux either. And so he put like this 500 hex lines of hex numbers in their bug report and said, this is what you have to do. And, and he tried to sort of, he knew it how, so he knew how to get it to work in OpenBSD, but he didn't want to commit it because it added like 13 kilobytes in the kernel. And the Linux guys figured out a way to make it more compact by looking for patterns in the sequence. And wrote, wrote like a for loop in C with some tables and indexing and stuff, and so they could bring it, bring it down in size and report it back to, to Joshua. And, and so then when I saw this, I said, well, that's something I could do. You know, I can take the, the Linux approach, take Joshua's patch, and just sort of try to make it work together. And that's what I did. And I said, Joshua was diff. And so we ended up adding about three kilobytes to the kernel with this. And, and yeah, the speakers are working now. But it would be really, really nice if vendors gave us hardware documentation so we didn't have to do this kind of stuff. If you want to know how he reversed it, then it is there. Um, yeah, so the microphone was a different thing. It didn't work out of the box. And this turned out to be a problem in the way that the mixer is wired up. So I could simply fix it in the configuration. It didn't have to change any code. So it took me a while to figure this out. But eventually I spotted that both of the microphone sources were set to mic two. And once I set one of them to the first microphone, it just started working. And I mailed Alexander about this. And he says, yeah, he has plans to fix the default config somehow to, to mix it up by default so that you always get all the mic sources. And that's something he still, he still doesn't want to do later. So in the 90s, uh, Morris's theater career was, was going crazy. He was at the Academy of Arts in Berlin, directed plays there. And he broadcasted a show called The Morris and Boris Show on a pirate station in Berlin on radio, FM. And uh, he, he told me, yes, yes, he uh, wants to show me the show, but it's on VHS. And um, I don't have a VHS player, so I didn't watch it yet. He doesn't have DVDs of it or anything. So we were thinking of showing a segment here, but since we don't have a digital version of it, it's kind of tricky. Uh, he also sobered up a lot. Um, this is him with his parents. Uh, he started becoming uh, an athlete, actually. So he did lots of sports. You know, before that, he was like smoking, drinking, and all that, and then he, then he stopped and he, he changed his life um, entirely and started cycling and doing aerobics and stuff. And um, by his account, had more or less steady relationships and everything was good. Well, except then, of course, uh, shortly after that, he got the accident in the gym. And um, he was actually supposed to go back to England at that point. So his family was trying to get him back to England. But his girlfriend, Simona, she said, well, you know, he's not fit to travel. He can't stay here. And he has this huge support network of friends here, and uh, we have to keep him. And so she uh, made sure that he stayed in Berlin and stayed in hospital there, uh, for which he uh, calls her a hero and a saint today. And um, after he got out of hospital, he couldn't speak. Uh, so he, he um, started doing lots of therapy. And one of the things he did was he started doing painting classes. So he, that's how he learned to paint. So he learned to paint after the accident and um, did it as a way to express himself. And he's still, today, he's still busy retraining all the skills that he's lost. And essentially, if he stops training them, they degrade again. So, so he puts it that um, if, if he practices, he stays like this in a, in a steady line. But if he stops speaking, for example, for a few days, it goes da, 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 da. That's what he said. So it's like it's, it's degrading. And he has to keep exercising the skills to keep them. He has a very uh, <laughs> horrible relationship with passwords. <laughs> um, he can't remember them. So they must be written down, right? And he, he can't really reliably type long passwords. Um, so the thing was that I set up the machine to be secure by default when I installed 6.4 for the first time. So he had a disk encryption password. He had a root password, which he never used, of course. But he had a user password, which GDM was asking him for. And then he had the password manager password, the master password for Firefox uh, thingy, which has all these things. And GNOME keyring was there, too, and it was all like, a huge mess. And the thing was that um, he actually couldn't 
even use the password prompts because, for instance, Softray doesn't indicate visual feedback. So he called me the day after I left the laptop with him. He called me the next morning. He says, it doesn't work. You know, what's not working? It's not working. I pressed the keys. It's not working. It's like, where are you? What do you see? It's like, well, I see white text, and I want to put one of the, I don't know which one it is, but it's one of these you gave me, and I'm trying to type it, but it's not working. You say, oh, yeah, but you, you don't see feedback in the boot prompt. Like, you know, so you can just type it in and enter, and it's going to be fine. And he says, why is that? And I say, well, because we don't want you know, people to see how long your password actually is when you type it in public. And he says, OK, I get it. I understand that you guys, security nerds, need that. But for me, this makes it really hard because I have to go back and look where in the password I am after four or five characters because I don't know where I am anymore. And so I said, yeah. Um, I thought of proposing a software patch to make this place stars, but I thought, no, this is probably not the right approach and people are not going to like it, even in the config now. Um, so the thing is, this was even made worse by software bugs. Um, because he didn't even, you know, once he got the boot, pro boot password entered, the machine booted, fine, right? Then he'd say, well, then it does it one more time when he locks to GNOME, and it's fine. But the thing is that GNOME didn't actually start off reliably. So even though he had typed his password correctly, he would just be going back to the prompt. Because GNOME just crashed and produced a core number. And it was like, well, this is really, really unfriendly, you know? It's, and users have actually reported this problem also, but for them it was just a nuisance. You know, you just try it three times and you're in. And you type your passwords fast. But for him, like entering a password is like a five minute ordeal. And so this was basically like, I can't use this machine. It's too complicated. I, I cannot do it. And so I got the idea to say, well, no, no, no. First I picked no. Okay. <laughs> so, so I looked at the core files and I fixed the startup bug, which ended up being a user after free in glib, where glib was violating its own internal API contract, and there was a thread that that was freeing a resource, but another thread was still waiting for it. And the first thread actually did try to wait, but it only called the wait function once, and then continued to free the resource, and it didn't actually call it a loop because. The thing is that if you're waking up from, from sleeping a sleeping thread, there's no guarantee that your condition is true that you're waiting on. So you have to check it and go back to sleep if it's false. And this is basically what we ended up doing. There was a bit of complication with mutexes and stuff, and if you're interested in that, you can read it on the, on the GitLab where I reported the bug and sent, sent my patch. And yeah, <laughs> when, I got the, when I got the laptop back from him and, and to, for a reset up or to reinstall it, I, I looked at his home directory and found this, and I'm like, you know what? I mean, it's, it's great that OpenBSD is catching all these bugs, right? But we're not actually going after each of these. I mean, we're fixing some of them. Sometimes they're due to limits. Sometimes they're used after freeze or whatever, but they're not being looked at. I mean, this, like, this is OpenBSD Explorer, right? We're still supporting this release. And the port tree is just half broken. I don't know. It's just it doesn't feel right. I mean, I know that the debugging tools are also not on par with uh, what we have on other systems, and that we should improve them to make this easier to fix. But um, I think we need a bit more effort in the port tree to actually get rid of all these things as soon as they start occurring, or at least figure out what's going on and document. Like for example, if it's a U limit problem, then mention it in the readme so that people can actually set the limits right, so they don't run into this. And if it's a bug, then put a I write a patch for it and push it to the upstream project. And, and I think uh, it's not just the port maintainers that have to do this, but they need people from the, they need help from the people who work on the base system stuff because they understand the stuff better. I mean, I'm looking at all the threading stuff, and yes, I've debugged problems like this multiple times before, so I can reason about it. And many people who work in the port street don't have this kind of expertise, so we need to pull resources there to, to not have users with two gigabytes of core limits in their home directories. I mean, that's just the best. So the solution to Morris's problem is actually a passwordless laptop, right? And I thought, well, is there a way to do that? And, and it turns out there is, because some years ago, I worked on getting software key disks to work in the bootloader, and that has been working quite well for some time. And so I used this feature to um, basically replace the software passphrase of boot with the key disk. And so you can plug the key disk, boot the machine, and he's authenticated, right? The machine starts booting. Um, I also set the GDM 
uh, laptop to uh, the, the, the login manager to log him in automatically into his user account. He doesn't have to type the password there. And disable the log screen so the password wouldn't show up if you leave the machine lying around. I disabled all the password manager stuff and just told everything to just save passwords in plain text. It's fine. At this level of security that's required here, this is perfectly OK. All we need is, to say is, is that when Marx ever loses his laptop or it gets stolen, that people can easily get at the data. And this is still true. So, and then, of course, I visited all the websites he needs once and saved the credentials. And since then, he's never complained about passwords ever again. Uh, managing the key lists is uh, interesting as well. So um, the machine has USB C ports, so I had to go out and find USB C key lists. And I um, specifically looked for key lists that can be handled um, one handedly. So these you see are, uh, you know, you can sort of like twist the little metal thing around with your thumb, or you can, you can shift the, this, the other one back and forth with your thumb. So it's, it's easy. He can handle them. And um, I didn't, wasn't really sure which one he preferred. I ended up preferring the metal one in the end, even though first he saw both of them and wanted to try the other one first. But yeah, basically, you have to try out how the handling works. And then, so it will just turn up to be One problem was that he sometimes didn't actually plug the key list all the way in because there was a little bit of resistance. And you had to push it in a bit hard. But um, it's OK. And he, like, he has a bit of, had lots of tricks to to get resistance. So when, when he has one hand and he has to plug something on this side of the laptop, he like puts a book or something there on the other side so that he can actually push against it. Because he has no way of, of pushing, of making uh, pressure the other way. So he's got lots of tricks there. It's interesting. Um, after the accident, he uh, thought he couldn't act. And he was basically saying, well, my acting career is over. He was in a wheelchair. And um, he couldn't speak, so he started the painting stuff. And then his, um, his girlfriend figured out that there's a theater group in Berlin, which is actually quite prominent in Germany. They're working with disabled actors. And um, she brought him there. You know, he arrived there in a wheelchair and told the, the director that Morris believed he couldn't act anymore. And the director took Morris out of the wheelchair, put him on the floor, you know, check which limbs were working, and said, act. <laughs> <laughs> and Morris screamed. <laughs> That's all he could do, right? But he got the part. <laughs> <laughs> so we tried lots of accessibility software. Um, the stuff that comes in GNOME is uh, interesting and, and very good for lots of use cases. However, it turns out that we have to leave all of this disabled because it's all geared towards different problems than, than Morris's problems. And um, so you can read text fine. You can use the keyboard just fine. If we set, you know, there are settings like uh, make the keyboard less uh, responsive or you know, make it deal with like double key presses and stuff. And he didn't want it because he felt inhibited by it. He said, no, I can't type. You know, it's fine. I just, I just, I'm just slow when, when I write. So it shouldn't, it should behave normally. And his problem was more like attention span and being distracted. It's not like, it's not like he can't see anything or read anything. So, so we didn't, we didn't enable any of these, but we, we played with the thing that called, that's called text suggest, which we, uh, which is basically inspired by, by phones that suggest words when you type them. And um, I made him try that on his phone. I said, are you using this? He said, yes, I'm using it on my phone. So I said, yeah, so let's try to make something like this work in OpenBSD. And I found a software that um, looks like this. Um, it's written by a student from India, and it's really, really nice, actually. It's, um, it's a nice hack because it uses all these holes in X11 that you always hear about where people can like steal your so your input and do keyloggers and things, and, and it's doing all this to give you basically, um, like you, you type a word, like I started typing suggestion in the browser bar there, and in the browser, and then I hit a key that makes text suggest um, basically mark the area I just typed on, which, and it uses a window manager hotkey for this. So if, you, if you're using a GDK application, the default <coughs> key binding is used to select text. Then the, then the thing presses Control-C for you. And it has another uh, 
thing running that's communicated with or with us that actually fetches the chip of contents from X and does a match against the dictionary. And it does a fuzzy match. So even if you type the word, the word wrong in the beginning, it will still match against the list somehow. And it gives you a list of, of things that, that are sort of you know, similar. And then you can pick the word you want. And when you, once you've picked it, it goes, deletes the word that you've just typed and pastes the content of the clipboard, which it has replaced with the word you, you picked. And so, yeah, this is written in C++. Um, it uses C++ APIs to talk to the clipboard. It uses X2 tool to do all the key typing. So it shells out there. Um, it's prototype quality, so it's it has some bugs, like when you start using the mouse in this window, it will stop working because it's supposed you're supposed to like use the keyboard to select a word, and and if you you know there's this little selection window on the top with the cursor. If you use a mouse that is empty all of a sudden and is never refilled by the application, so it basically becomes useless. But I trained Morris to only use the keyboard for this, and it's fine. But you know there's still a lot of things that could be improved there. But it, it was interesting and. Um, of course, it was hard to port um, because so this program is basically has been copied. It's like glue code that gets many components from GitHub and things and all C++ classes and just glues them together to do what it wants to do. And so one of the things that he needed to do, the author, was to, um, to call programs like a tool. And there's a there's a C++ header file on GitHub that you can use for that, and it, it's including some glue C++ extension to do buffering of the input and output. And that meant it didn't compile with Clang. And I had to go and rewrite this whole class to just like dump stuff to files, to IO streams, and just use the standard C++ APIs to get it even to build. You know? um, then there was um, the clipboard class that he was using. It had a great API, it looked really neat, but it had lots of bugs in it. And, uh, the threading in it, so, so it, had, it assumed it was running in the threaded app, which it wasn't, but you know, the author still assumed it. And so I had to go and, and fix all the mutex calls that were like double unlocking and, and all this kind of stuff. And it was interesting because the C++ mutex stuff is using lots of wrappers and is doing abstractions. And so, for example, the mutexes get unlocked when you, when you the structure of a class implicitly, so you don't see it in the code. So the first time you look at the code, you're like, what's going on? Where are these unlock calls coming from? And then you have to set breakpoints and in, in pthread and dial back up the stack to see where you're actually being called. And it took me like a day or two to, to, to figure out what the problem actually was. But yeah, this is it's nice that the pthread um, actually exposes these bugs for us. And Upstream was very, very responsive to this. And I sent the patch to fix it for me. And, they committed an unapproved patch, and I was very happy with that. But it shows again that when you port software to OpenBSD, it tends to reveal bugs that you don't see on other systems. Now, um, is Textedus really the right tool for the job? Uh, in the kitchen, Morris has a tool that's quite interesting. It's a one-handed knife, and that's usually the right tool for the job when he needs to cut something. So you can use it with just one hand. Um, he um, so the problem with text suggests that we wanted to solve is that Morris is unable to write short messages. He doesn't have to write a book with it, but he should be able to write like email messages, Facebook messages, and stuff like that. Um, he didn't actually end up using it a lot. So when I when I asked him after a while, you know, are you still using this? He's like, well, I forgot the key it was bound to, and so I had to write it down and um, mark the key on the keyboard. And then the thing is like, yeah, you're using it, yeah, but it's always using American English. And he doesn't like that. And this is something we need to fix because the thing has like one built-in dictionary and that's it. And um, yeah, so perhaps, I'm thinking perhaps he will start getting used to it eventually and use it more. But uh, so I received one email from him since and it was perfectly written. And uh, of course he had asked uh, someone else to write it um, because that's still easier, right? So. As long as it's easier for him to go and ask someone to, to write a message, then using the computer, he'll probably keep coming back to asking people. I mean, that's what's wrong with that. But it's just that, you know, I, we tried it. And I'm not quite sure if it's really, really helping. But I think there's still some time to see whether 
you will start using that again years from now. There's another tool that we looked at, which is called Simon, which is very interesting, which is um, a speech recognition framework that's very generic. You can use any language, any spoken language. It can be trained with a custom vocabulary, and then you can bind application-specific commands to those words. And you can control the mouse with it, but it's really neat, so they subdivide the screen into, into nine squares, and then you say a number, and then the square you pick gets subdivided again, and the mouse cursor moves to its center. And then you can repeat this process until you're somewhere, and you can say, oh, click on a, on a link. And so, and I showed Marcos the video of this, and then I have a nice demo video on this side, it looks really good. And he said, oh yeah, I'd like to try that, it looks like Star Trek, that's cool. You know? And so, so yeah, he wanted to try it. And I um, got it to work, sort of more or less. So it's, it, a lot of the components were already in the port screen that we, that we needed. Um, this, was, this was very good. So KDE4 stuff was there, Cube was there, CMU Sphinx was already there in an older version. I updated that and added some more components to it. Um, and I had to write an SMEO backend so it can actually do the microphone and, and record words and all that stuff. That was good. Um, however, um, there's a lot of complexity in it. And that is sort of bad if you have no maintainers anymore since 2015. Because um, the person who started the project is no longer working on it. There was another person who took over maintenance, and then some years ago in 2015 said, I'm going to go on vacation to you later, and never came back. Um, so, yeah, and, and the one problem with this application design, because it's so modular, they have um, stuff on KDE, on apps of KDE.org that you have to download to get it to work. Like you can download the base model for English, the dictionary for English, and the mouse control scenario. Or you download the Firefox scenario as well, and all that stuff. And it's all there in the App Store, and it's all presented to you as, as being available, but it's not. It doesn't work. Downloads are broken, um, the files are missing, um, they are incompatible with what's actually in the code, and it's, it's a mess. And so I decided, well, you know, to actually make this work. And I even tried generating all my own models and everything, because they say that's what you can do as well. You don't have to start with our stuff, you just generate your own stuff. So I tried that and ran into all sorts of bugs and crashes with it, and, and it was just, I figured, well, if I want to get this to work, I have to become the Simon Oxford developer, and I don't want to just do that. And so I shelved the work and put it um, on my website. If somebody else wants to be continuing, running this on OpenBSD as possible. However, it's not really working, but it's, it's there. Yeah, and so I said, sorry, Mars, um, we can't try it. He said, oh, okay, like, you know, because I asked, this is very disappointing to you. He said, well, I don't know, you know, I, I can't say. Without trying it, I have no idea what happened going on. So, he didn't mind too much. So, back to his acting career in the 2000s, um, he really learned how to speak. He received lines, uh, his lines and plays for an earpiece. And this was challenging in part because the earpiece often stopped working. <laughs> so the director was giving him lines and he was like, what's going on? And it took him years to actually learn the lines of, of the play and then another play and then another play. But eventually, so he remembers quite a bit of things and so I'm, I'm seeing them every Tuesday, the group, and um, I'm practicing songs right now. And so he's singing the songs that he learned as a child because he still remembers them. And, but yeah, it's, it's, you can see how his memory works there. He also um, learned to play the accordion and the cello one-handed. I haven't seen him do it, but, but it's, it's, it sounds impressive. And they've toured uh, Denmark, Poland, Switzerland, Germany, and there was another um, group that formed uh, with the, the theater that he joined, split up into two groups, and he became a founding member of the Kalibani Theater, where I am at the meeting. Um, yeah, so some words about system administration topics. Um, he wanted to get backups to work, and I wanted to make sure that um, I can easily restore the system and he doesn't lose much data. But just for ease of use, I ended up just using the GNOME data dot tool that backs up his home directory. And I mean, if the system gets lost, I, I wrote a setup guide, how to set up the laptop, which uh, you can also read after this talk, uh, basically explaining what we did from the bare home BSD installs to where he is now. And um, yeah, so I know how to, how to reinstall the system, right? But I don't want to lose his data. So this was perfect for that. It um, had, had a bug where the background job didn't actually run. 
uh, we noticed that recently, and that one, uh, Jacinto was really kind and, and just fixed it in current for me. So that's now working. Uh, for the remote administration stuff, I thought, well, so Morris is never actually logging in as root or anything like this, right? But he probably is going to end up in some situation somewhere in a coffee shop where you know, I set up the Wi-Fi joint feature to just make him automatically connect and he will somehow click through the thing and put a, the cup of portal and be online, and he will have some issue. And maybe I'm a candidate at the time, and um, he wants me to help him. So what do I do? He has a private IP, and also I don't want to be snooping around on his computer without him knowing that I'm doing it. And so I have this idea where um, his user interface should be a very simple button to click, to allow me to enter the laptop. Right? So that's what this shows. It's like a desktop file entry that I added to the machine that says allow remote administration. And when he clicks it, his machine opens an SSA connection to the jump host that I'm hosting. And I can connect to the same machine over SSH and then connect back to his laptop through a reverse tunnel. And this shows how it's set up. And um, he sees this window. And of course, as soon as he closes this window, his SSH session is dying, and I have no I no longer have access to the machine. So this keeps him in control, even though he doesn't actually know what I'm doing, or he doesn't actually know what Unix commands are and how they work. But um, he can be sure that when this window isn't running, I'm not like spying on him or whatever. I also wanted to find something that other people can replicate, of course. So this is not, I mean, he's my friend and he probably trusts me, but this is also something you can use in other situations where it's less clear what the trust relationship is like. So he's generally very um, good, in a, in a very good mood these days. Um, he's, very, he's a very happy guy. Um, he, so there's one anecdote which I'd like to tell, which is when we went to, um, to a public toilet at Alexanderplatz. And the lift was broken, so he wanted to use the lift to go down, but it was broken, and so he had to use the stairs. And the stairs were a windy staircase with the handlebar on the wrong side for him. So he ended up walking backwards, down the stairs backwards. Right? And there was an old woman coming up the stairs, so she was also having lots of trouble getting up. And they met halfway down the staircase, and, and she said, oh, you know, life is hard, isn't it? And Morris respond, responded, well, positively speaking, I can do this. You know, so he's, a, he's, a, he's a, always in a good mood and always sees the positive side of things, even though he, he, he has this immense struggle that everyone sort of notices when they meet him. But the thing is that I also believe that what, what's playing a role here is that he understands what it's like not to be disabled, because he lived half his life as a not disabled person. And that's, that's kind of interesting, because a lot of people also in the theater group, for example, they've been disabled their whole life and they don't know, they don't really know the difference between work with him, you can really tell that he understands what life is like for us. You know, it's, it's interesting. This is him uh, getting his German citizenship. He was really scared of Brexit. And he said, <laughs> <laughs> he said they're going to they're gonna throw me out and, and so on. And he doesn't want to go back to the UK. And, and, and so he actually got, uh, so one problem with this was that his, his career, right? He came here as a student, he started acting, then he had the accident. And since then, his official record was just therapy, 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 therapy. Nothing else, and so the theater director wrote him a letter uh, to the to the council that said, "Well, he's been in these plays, and he's done this acting and this culture project, and um, sent lots of pictures with it, some of which I used here in this talk." And and they gave it to him. They just gave it to him like that, and now he's a dual UK German citizen, and he's really happy about it. So, <laughs> yeah, this is. Um, this is, uh, in this lab, this is the laptop. You know, he was he was very concerned because it's a Huawei laptop. It had the Huawei. <laughs> and he said, oh no, it's the Chinese. You know, I heard this flying. It's on the news. And I said, well, yeah, we can fix that for you. I have an NSA sticker. Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was fine, he was fine with that. <laughs> so I didn't mention the video uh, yet, right? I mentioned it in the beginning. Um, but um, what I wanted to try here is actually a live demo of that. So, I'm gonna, so this is probably going to fail. I will try 
a video call from an OpenBSD laptop across an OpenBSD Spark 6.4 machine to another OpenBSD laptop in Canada, which is here in the of Berlin. So if Firefox lets me, I'll have to window with this. Hello? Hi. Are you there? Yes. Yes, hi. <laughs> Nice to see you. Do you want to see the audience, Morris? I can turn your laptop around. Look how many people there are. Hello. Can you see that? Hello. Hello. <laughs> no, you're, you're in America again. Yeah, you're very much welcome. Thank you for being here. Do you want to do the Q&A with me? Thank you I go here so you can see me. Can you see me now? Yes, you can see me. I can't hear you. So we have this microphone here. I can try to turn it up a bit. Does anybody want to ask a question or anything? It's better? Okay. So what do you, how do you feel about being in Canada? <laughs> Hello? Hello? How do you feel about being in Canada again? Or you, you, um, ah, the signal is very jumbled. Where are you in Canada? In Ottawa. Ottawa. Yeah, have you been to Ottawa yet? No, I have lots of relatives there. Sorry, can you repeat that? Maybe you know what I'll do? I'll disable the video. It's probably going to fix the audio problem. Uh, let me just check here. Just temporarily clicking on this. Hello? Maybe it's going to fix now. It's going to be fixed now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's better now, isn't it? Yeah, that's good, because I, I turned it off because the audio was bad. Okay, okay, fine. So now more is... Can I sing? Yes you can. yes, you can sing, no problem. Can I sing a Monty Python song? Of course. Yes! <laughs> 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 uh, when I was a child, I was a child. <laughs> of course, yeah. I'll make one to five seconds. And uh, I have a picture of the mountain bike scene. Oh, you want to show it? Oh, yeah, you got it. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's good. Which scene is that? Which scene is that? I don't know. Does anybody know which one this is from? It's the Python, but I don't know. Okay, okay. And, uh, can I sing? Yes, of course. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I love London town. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. Sad to think of her, where I go. I get the final feeling inside of me, just walking up and down. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I love London chat. Do it! <laughs> So where were you ever in Canada before? Have you been to Canada before? No. Oh, but you were. Yes, so many teachers have. Oh, okay, I see. You have family here. Uh, I think uh, they are living in Canada. Do you know where? 
in Dublin today, right, with the drivers, they do the same. They have glass in front of them. Back in the 80s, they already had it in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. So, what, where are we for time, actually? Are we we're over? Okay, Morris, we're over time. So, we have to stop the call. We're over time, so we have to stop the call. I'm very glad that you took this okay. opportunity to be with us. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.